Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are honored to host this afternoon Dr. Khalid Al Awaisi, a doctor who is the executive director of Islamic Jerusalem Research Academy based in Turkey. And Dr. Khalid's speciality is in the historical geography of Baytul Muqaddas and the geographical interpretations of the Quran. He has also published a groundbreaking monograph, Mapping Islamic Jerusalem a rediscovery of geographical boundaries 2007 in which he has able to unearth the geographical extent of Beitul Muqaddas. He is currently in South Africa touring the major parts of the country, KZN, Johannesburg, as well as Cape Town in an effort to conduct workshops uh, with the intention of spreading authentic knowledge, uh, creating a deeper understanding in the Ummah about the Islamic Palestinian cause and also higher level of consciousness and a higher level of commitment as far as the Palestinian cause is concerned. Uh, Dr. Khalid, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Hayyakum Allah wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hayyakum Allah. MashaAllah. I'm very intrigued by your approach, uh, a knowledge-based approach as opposed to just uh, doing something that's short-term. Mm-hmm. And uh, give us some context to this approach of yours when it comes to the Palestinian cause. Yes, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. First of all, we have tried uh, different approaches over the last century. Uh, Baytul Maqdis, Palestine, has been under occupation since 1917. Mm. The British occupied it for 30 years, then handed it over to the Zionists. And negotiations with the British, uh, armed resistance, everything has been tried, and everything has failed so far. And uh, the approach uh, the within the Academy of Baytul Maqdis, of Islamic Jerusalem Studies, is that we look back through history. And always uh, knowledge is at the base of uh, the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis. Starting with the uh, example of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi only picked the fruit. Mm. Military confrontation was the last step that was preceded by a lot of preparation uh, by uh, Imad al-Din, Nur al-Din Zinki, and before them the ulama. The ulama were setting the foundation for reviving knowledge on Bayt al-Maqdis amongst the Muslims. And actually this showed us, takes us back to the best model, to the best example, which is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our beloved messenger, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prepared the sahaba in Mecca, in, a, in the very difficult times, spiritually, religiously, politically, and in Medina, also on the same route, until Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started uh, uh, sending the armies towards Bayt al-Maqdis. And this, uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew that he was not able to achieve it during his lifetime, as he mentioned to one of the companions that the Fath of Bayt al-Maqdis shall take place after his death. Abu Bakr continued on this path, and he sent the, the heroes of the Muslims immediately, 12 days after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inside Bayt al Maqdis, inside the region of Bayt al-Maqdis, inside the Holy Land. And then on their return, and uh, Abu Bakr then sent uh, four, five, six Muslim armies towards Bilad al-Sham and towards Bayt al-Maqdis. And uh, as Abu Bakr uh, radiallahu anhu was on his deathbed, uh, the news uh, of a battle, major battle with the Byzantines was taking place. He passed away, Umar became the Khalif, and Umar... During his time, the Fath of Bayt al-Maqdis took place and Umar only for the Fath of Bayt al-Maqdis, he left Medina. Mm. He did not leave it for any other conquest of any other region just because of the love of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam placed in the hearts of the Sahaba Radwanullahi Alayhim. So we see knowledge is the foundation. Without it, we might Something happens today in Al-Aqsa, we will see South Africa, uh, everyone uh, across the Muslim world standing up, trying to do something. Mm. Uh, but 
beyond demonstrations, beyond uh, this, no one uh, takes it any further. Within a few days, the issue dies out. People give donations. People uh, go to demonstration, and that's it. it gone until the next episode. Mm. This idea is that Beit al-Maqdis needs to be in every household in South Africa. It needs to be in every household across the Muslim world. Uh, it needs to be the agenda for every Muslim until the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa mm. and Bayt Al-Maqdis. And I suppose this is the greatest uh, threat to the occupiers, yes. the knowledge-based approach. Yes, yes. And the occupation, uh, actually from the British occupation, uh, they helped establish the Hebrew University mm -hmm. in uh, Bayt Al-Maqdis. And when the Muslim ulama met in 1930 and 1931, uh, they decided that one of the outcomes of the ulama meeting from across the Muslim world is to establish Al-Aqsa mm -hmm. International University next to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And the British occupation, the Zionists, put so many hurdles that this was never to take place because knowledge is the biggest threat. And uh, the Zionists across uh, uh, the decades of uh, conflict with them, uh, knowledge is the biggest, uh, the biggest hurdle. Uh, uh, someone who was uh, drawing um, uh, cartoons mm. in London, Najil Ali, a cartoonist, he was assassinated by the, the, the Zionists. All he was doing is using his pen to portray what was happening mm. uh, on, 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 on the ground. Uh, many, many scholars are the target of these uh, Zionists. In, in 1994, the Zionists expelled 400 academics and uh, uh, scholars out of Palestine because knowledge, uh, as one of the uh, soldiers uh, and interrogators once said to my father, he said, the pen that you use, the words that you are saying, are more dangerous than uh, a thousand guns. Mm. Uh, with uh, if you use uh, guns, th they have more more guns to confront you with. But if you use ideas and thoughts and uh, bring ideas to end the occupation, then this is more of a threat on the long on the long term. Yes, indeed. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also spoke uh, about this: that the tongue being mightier than the sword yes. in terms of its influence. Now, what led you to adopting this particular approach, a knowledge-based approach? Were you schooled in this direction? Mm -hmm. Did you take influence from somebody? How did you come into this? Yes, actually, I zo joined the the field of Islamic Jerusalem studies uh, uh, since. Uh, my young young days although i studied engineering mm. but then i changed the field but this goes back to um uh, when we lived in uh in palestine in al khalil and my father was teaching both at the uh, al khalil university and at al quds university and one of the courses he was teaching was um bayt al maqdis throughout history and the course was taught inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And it was taught on the Masatib of Ilm uh, around it to undergraduate students. And my father used to take us with him. And that's how we became attached to, 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 to this field. After the expulsion of my father uh, and uh, exile uh, of our family outside Palestine, uh, my father, who within... Uh, when he was even in Palestine, they set up the Palestine Ulama League. And part of it was to develop research and knowledge uh, on, on, on this topic. He, from exile, continued this project with a number of uh, academics in, in, in the UK, in Britain, uh, Muslim academics. And they developed this uh, uh, Academy for Islamic Jerusalem Studies uh, from 1994. It started with an annual conference, uh, an um, academic uh, journal, mm -hmm. and scholarship for students to study this field. And uh, eventually it started creating this uh, knowledge based.
based scholarship. So some students studied history of Beit al-Maqdis in the early period. Others studied it for in terms of archaeology and architecture. Uh, some studied the Muslim-Christian relations. How should we deal with non-Muslims in relation to Beit al-Maqdis? How did Umar ibn Khattab and Salah al-Din and the Ottomans deal with it? Others studied the uh, uh, fiqhi uh, issues uh, like Sheikh Ra'ad Fathi uh, he studied the uh, jurisprudence relation in in relation to Al Masjid Al Aqsa and Beit Al Maqdis, and this was his PhD. Dr. Haytham Aratru did an excellent work on the uh, architecture and archaeology of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, particularly in the early Muslim period, how the Sahaba and the Tabi'een developed the architecture of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, uh, and uh, others. And within uh, with within this team. I studied the geography and the Quranic uh, geographical concepts mm. uh, around Beit al-Maqdis, particularly the land of Baraka, Al-Ard al-Muqaddasa, uh, Beit al-Maqdis, the region of Beit al-Maqdis. And all these terminologies, unfortunately, we have lost. Mm. These were part of the Muslim identity for centuries with colonization, the colonizers, particularly the uh, British, they set new boundaries for Palestine. Uh, it is no longer Beit al-Maqdis. We set new boundaries. They set new identities, new flags, and everything is within the boxes that have been drawn by these uh, uh, occupiers. Mm -hmm. This was a revival of the Islamic concepts mentioned in the Quran, mentioned in the Hadith, mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, known to the Sahaba and to the Tabi'een and Tabi'i Tabi'een. For a very long time, this was what the, 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 the Muslims knew until we uh, started the ages of decline and we lost all of this. So it is, uh, I'm just one person within this team of uh, scholarship. And this, we had uh, a symposium, uh, a conference on this issue, the role of knowledge in the Fatah of Bayt al-Maqdis. And we looked at uh, uh, the paper I gave, I looked at the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions in this regard, but others looked at the example of Salah din and other mm -hmm. uh, examples of how knowledge is crucial before uh, taking the step. And actually, this was taken by Orientalists and colonizers. Before colonizers uh, would take a land, first they would send their researchers. Mm -hmm. They would research the area. They would know the differences in the different groups, the different, uh, how they can play on the different uh, uh, important things between people what makes people different so and the british had this uh, uh rule divide and rule mm. and they used it efficiently across wherever they went and uh first they sent their researchers they investigated the place they knew how to where to enter from how to take uh, control of these regions and then they settled and colonized these, these lands. For the Muslims, it was exactly the opposite. Knowledge is the basis for the Futuhat. And the Muslims never, when they conquered half of the world, uh, never did they uh, compulse anyone to follow Islam. It was the idea is to remove the barriers with Islam and allow people to adopt Islam if they wish to, uh, to do so. Mm. Interesting indeed. And looking at your monograph that you, you know, penned mapping Islamic Jerusalem, um, as you also mentioned that when the British occupied the lands and the colonizers, they redefined the boundaries. So how do you then bring, you know, the, the modern day research and also to bring the historical context together and present it to the Muslim ummah, uh, looking at your masterpiece, the mapping the Islamic Jerusalem? Talk to us more about that. Yes. Uh, actually, when the starting point for this was uh, two other researchers, Dr. Athman Atil and Dr. Haytham Ratrut. Mm. In their study, they came across something that uh, they could not resolve, something that was, we are misreading history or historical texts or even religious texts in a way that 
there is something not not right. For example, Dr. Uthman Atil, and he's looking at the books of Tabari, Waqidi, uh, all these early historians, Baladiri and others, and he's seeing that one is saying the Fath of Baytul Maqdis took place in the year 15, 16, mm. the other is saying, or 17, or 18. There is some inconsistency in what is going on. Either the Muslims were not uh, okay. documenting, or there is something that is not right. Mm. And once you start investigating, you actually see, actually, they were not uh, making mistakes. They were actually being very precise. The Fath of Bayt al-Maqdis did start in the year 13 and 14, but it was not completed until the a- year 18. Mm. But this is not talking about the city. This is talking about the region. Mm. And we... When we read this, we were reading the historical text that the word Beit al-Maqdis or Ilya w- was referring to the city only. Mm-hmm. When in reality, when Dr. Uh, Uthman, uh, he said, no, this is not referring to the city. It must refer to something else. And then I started the research uh, going into the uh, uh, tafsir, the books of hadith, the Quranic verses, trying to map out what is the Quran using uh, in, in, in Rasulullah in terms of terminology in relation to this land. Mm-hmm. And I surveyed most of the literature that was available at that time, published literature and some manuscripts, and tried to try to come to an understanding of first the terminologies that were used. And after looking at the terminologies, it was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa within his hadith, when he talks about Bayt al-Maqdis, he used the word Bayt al-Maqdis in three contexts. Mm-hmm. Like the Quran uses the word al-Masjid al-Haram in three contexts. The Quran uses it for the Haram al-Makki, the wider region. It uses it for uh, the city and the masjid, and it uses it for the Kaaba. Mm-hmm. The same once you start looking at the text, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used the word Bayt al-Maqdis for al-Masjid al-Aqsa. He used it in reference to the city, and there are examples of this. Uh, if we have time, we can go into them. The third is he uses it for the region. Mm. And this region, we completely lost uh, the usage of it. Uh, and even with uh, once the... Uh, the British and the Zionists occupied this land, we became uh, narrowed down to the boundaries they set. So we are even talking about East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. We're talking about the 1948 occupation, and 1967. We were stuck within the boundaries that were drawn by the British, and we do not go beyond that. What this did is actually, it, it freed us from the boundaries that are drawn by the 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 colonialist and occupation uh, powers in uh, in our mind and it returns this di- this issue to its original dimension which is the islamic uh, world they succeeded in narrowing down this issue from being an islamic the issue of the ummah to being an arab israeli war mm-hmm. and then narrowing it down today to being a palestinian issue it is not a Palestinian issue. It's a non, not an Arab issue. It is the issue of uh, the whole of the Muslims and actually anyone who has uh, a sense of humanity in his heart. Mm. Uh, this is something that does not affect uh, just the Palestinian. It goes well, well beyond that. So within this research, uh, I try to remap what... Bayt al-Maqdis, what al-Ard al-Muqaddasa, and what al-Ard al-Mubaraka within the Quranic and the prophetic tradition actually refer to. Mm. And how the early Muslim scholars, geographers, uh, used these terminologies and how they engaged with them. And I was fascinated that all the early Muslim scholars were uh, very aware of this region. Um, uh, from as early as uh, uh, the early Sahaba, Abu Ubaidah radiyallahu an, when uh, he was he died because of the plague of Hamas, mm. uh, but he was at that time stationed in uh, the northern region 
uh, of Palestine, actually even uh, towards today's Jordanian side, beyond the River Jordan, east of the River Jordan. And his final will was to his companions, bury me in Al-Ard al-Muqaddasa, west of the Jordan River. Mm. So he knew that Al-Ard al-Muqaddasa is west of the, the river. Then you have Abu Ubaid, uh, the great scholar of Quran, uh, Sahib Majaz al-Quran. He talks about the southern boundaries of Bayt al-Maqdis. He specifies exactly where they are. Others are specifying which cities are part of Bayt al-Maqdis until the great Muslim geographer, actually one of the greatest Muslim geographers, he lived in the 9th and the 10th century, uh, al-Bishari al-Maqdisi. He gives the extent of Bayt al-Maqdis in every sense. Mm. So he gives the dimensions and the dimensions, I was shocked, even I traveled uh, uh, to some of the areas to try to measure the distances. His distances were exactly very well calculated. Yeah. And we think to ourselves that we have the technology we are able, he was measuring uh, using the stars and also using ropes uh, to give exact dimensions between places. And actually the map is similar to what the staple <laughs> looks like. Uh, it, uh, it's a mirror image of it. Uh, so Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is right in the center uh, of, of, of this. And he says up to 40 miles. Wow. Uh, but these 40 miles is the 40 a Muslim mile Muslim at that time, which is around 2.2 kilometers. Mm. The different madhabs take different approaches, 1.95 or uh, 2 kilometers. But Al-Maqdis, as a geographer, he used 2.2 kilometers mm. after using, studying his mile. Uh, this was reached. So he says up to 40 mile is the maximum distance. Mm. And then he says, um, he takes it, uh, he mentions then, the main towns and villages. Mm. So he says part of it, part of this uh, holy land is the capital city, which is Ramla, and all its surrounding uh, 12 miles into the Mediterranean Sea from the other side, which is also very interesting because this is the first time we have someone using territorial water mm. to talk about uh, a, a, a sacred region or even uh, any, 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 any other region in that, in that sense. Then he gives the full dimension and all the scholars uh, who came after him and who, who have come also before him fit within this region, this is the region of the Holy Land, mm. uh, 85 kilometers from the center, uh, but not everything goes to the maximum radius. Uh, actually, some of it comes a bit shorter. But we lost this. This map uh, is, is lost in, in our literature. And reviving it actually takes us away from this colonialist uh, Zionist uh, plan. And it revives in our minds that this area is the holy land not by the messenger of Allah uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam but this was decreed decreed a holy land by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so whatever Allah decrees like he made the haram of Mecca a haram a sacred land Allah made this land a holy land and this when he makes it holy this comes from the divine, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This does not touch just the people living in that land. Mm. It touches every single Muslim wherever they are. This is like Ka the Kaaba is for every Muslim. Al-Aqsa and Al-Ard al-Muqaddasa is for every Muslim also. Subhanallah. Now, why do you believe mm. that the knowledge-based approach is the way to go? This actually we learn from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he started, Allah revealed to him the first word was Iqra, read. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave a lot of importance to knowledge. And the hadith you're aware of, knowledge, seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim and Muslimah. And Allah says this in, in the Quran that uh, there should always be a group that goes out and becomes knowledgeable so they are able to guide the, the, the rest of the community. But with the issue of Bayt al-Maqdis, um, even if we are, man we are strong militarily and manage to liberate Bayt al-Maqdis, the issue is not about liberating it, the issue is about preserving it. And this is not an easy matter. 
if you do not have strong belief and strong foundation to understand why this place is important to the Muslims in their past, the present and the future. Baytul Maqdis, Allah called it Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa and one of, uh, actually many of the ulama in their tafsir, the word Muqaddas means two things, Mubarak and Mutahar. So once you start going into the knowledge and the ulama say, لا يعمر فيها ظالم No tyrant will ever last in this land. And we saw the defeat of great powers in this land. This land has changed hand uh, so many times in history. But since Umar ibn Khattab entered, the crusaders came, occupied this land, and their end was in the hands of Salah al-Din. After a long preparation of knowledge, then that was their end. The, the, the Maghul, the Mongols, who came, their defeat was in the land of Bayt al-Maqdis, in the northern part of uh, the land of Bayt al-Maqdis. They destroyed the Muslim capitals. They came and their destruction, Allah made it in this land. This is a land where all tyrants will be destroyed. Mm. Uh, then came Napoleon in uh, the end of the 18th century and he was destroyed. He thought he can take the whole world. He was destroyed in the shores of Akka, in the land uh, uh, of Palestine. Then you have the, the British and the Zionist. They will not last. It is the sunnah of Allah. Uh, these people will not last. Looking at the history and the political example, looking at everything, this even... Uh, the current prime minister of the Zionist state, he said, I am afraid that this state will not last to reach its 80th anniversary. Mm. And now it is in the 70, uh, 76th anniversary that it's uh, uh, coming to. So they are afraid of, they know this and actually have prophecies, Jewish prophecies that says that this state will not reach its 80th birthday. Uh, but this will not change unless you have knowledge that you are able to develop in this, uh, in this, uh, direction. Uh, I talked about the past. Now talking about the future, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa taught us that this land is where the Dajjal will be killed by Isa alayhi salam, the biggest fitna in the world. Mm. Yet Juj and Majuj, another great fitna to the world, will be destroyed in this land. This is not our past and just our present. This is the land of the future of Islam and the, the Muslims. Therefore, going back to the issue of knowledge, knowledge gives us all these gateways. And without having this knowledge, based and established in the heart, mind and souls of Muslims across the world. We, if we take it today, we will lose it tomorrow. Mm. We need to make sure that Bayt al-Maqdis, no Muslim around the world will ever give it up. Salah al-Din, when Richard, the Lionheart, after he liberated, he comes and he says, give it back to us. He says to him, this, we don't mind having you living the Christians with us in this land, but this place for us, it is unquestionable. We cannot talk that we will give it up. We worked all our life to save it. Now to give it up to, to the crusaders, it is, it is, it is impossible. So knowledge is the foundation. Without knowledge, all our actions are sp spontaneous for a short period of time. We will uh, feel that we need to do something. We go into demonstration, we raise money. But then once the situation comes down, then the issue is forgotten. This is to keep it like Rasulullah did with the Sahaba in Mecca and in Medina. The Sahaba, it became everything in their life. There was a culture. Rasulullah would come out of his masjid, sit with, see the Sahaba sitting in a circle, and he would ask them, what are you talking about? They're talking about Bayt al-Maqdis. A woman, the, the, the servants, the, the cleaners in Medina, uh, like, uh, Maymuna, uh, she would send, the woman would send her to Rasulullah to ask, to give a fatwa about Bayt al-Maqdis. Rasulullah, when he would visit, uh, a, a, a sick, Sahabi in his house and he says I feel I am dying and this is my the end of my life Rasulullah says to him no you and your children will become the imams of al-masjid al-aqsa Rasulullah was using al-aqsa as to bring hope uh, to everyone imagine that this is what when we go and visit uh, someone who's sick or 
you actually give them hope by saying, inshallah, Allah will grant you a prayer in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa after its liberation. This will give that person uh, that hope, inshallah, we will be able to uh, achieve this. So the foundation, creating knowledge, is on the long term, is what we need. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, in authentic hadith, he talked about that the final stage of the Khilafah, it will be in Bayt al-Maqdis. Mm. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he mentions this, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى Rasulullah does not talk about uh, from his own mind. He knows this from uh, through wahi. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa tells the Sahaba that the prophethood will continue with you as long as Allah wills and then Allah will lift it. Mm-hmm. And it was ended with the uh, death of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he says it will be khilafa rashida ala minhaj al nubuwa. You will have khilafa on the same methodology of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Allah will lift it whenever Allah wishes to lift it. Then it will be uh, from father to son. Uh, the khilafa and it continued for 1300 years uh, from the time of Muawiyah radiallahu an until the end of the Ottoman period. The khilafa is passed from father to son. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about our time. He says, and then, يَكُونُ مُلْكًا جَبْرِيًا You will be ruled whether you like it or not. You will be ruled by force. And then Allah will lift it whenever Allah wishes to lift it. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to the end and he says, ثُمَّ تَكُونُ خِلَافَةً رَاشِدًا عَلَى مِنْهَاجِ النُّبُوَّةً ثُمَّ سَكَتْ Then it will be a khilafa on the method of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Rasulullah was silent. Rasulullah is telling us that this will take place. And we have lived through these four stages. Uh, the prophethood, the Khilafa Rashida, then uh, from father to son, the Sultana, and then we are living through this fifth stage, which is uh, being ruled by force, and we see across the Muslim world how the Muslims are ruled. Then, at the end of this, when Allah wishes for this to be lifted, then it will be on the methodology of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it will be like the days of Umar and Abu Bakr and Uthman. It will bring back the Izzah back to Islam. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he uh, talks about uh, uh, the Khilafah coming to Bayt al-Maqdis, he tells Abdullah ibn Hawala, إِذَا دَنَتِ الْخِلَافَةُ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ الْمُقَدَّسَةِ When the Khilafah will come to Bayt al-Maqdis, to Al-Ardu al-Muqaddasah, then this is when the great signs of the Day of Judgment will start uh, approaching. So the Khilafa, Rasulullah وسلم, gives us hope that we will go back again to uh, the great days of Islam. Uh, and the, the, the point will be in Bayt al-Maqdis. Actually, Rasulullah وسلم, received this mandate in Al-Masjid al-Aqsa during the night journey. When Rasulullah met with 124,000 prophets in a summit of prophets was never to take place anywhere else before or after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Adam all the way to Isa Alayhi Wasallam and the Imam in Salah. This is very crucial as Ibn Kathir and Ibn Taymiyyah and many of the scholars mentioned. This was not an ordinary prayer. Rasulullah leading the Salah meant that all the prophets accept his leadership and they handing, they handed over the reins of the leadership of humanity to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to his Ummah. And Rasulullah received this mandate in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. So Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is related to the Izza of this Ummah. And to receive such a mandate in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa on that blessed night, the Ummah has left this for the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. And you see our situation today across the Muslim world. For this Ummah to start again, to to, to rise again, we need to be able to uh, uh, take back Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And Al-Aqsa is related to everything. When the Muslims had Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, they were in great power and great strength. When they lose it, like at the time before Salah al-Din, they uh, were in the lowest uh, level. And now we see our situation. And then, inshallah, once it is liberated, but this will be the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is not for Palestinians. Mm. It will be the revival of this Ummah. 
and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about how Islam will be able to reach ends of the world. Uh, no house in this world will be left without Islam entering it. Every single house on this earth, Islam will be introduced to it. This will be, uh, as one uh, scholar of hadith uh, talks about, this will be even longer than the period of the Khulafa al-Rashidin based on another hadith narrated by Abu uh, Dawood in his, uh, in, in his uh, Musnad. So uh, you see that actually Bayt al-Maqdis is related to the future of Islam. And without it, we will not be able to uh, uh, proceed forward. And this is also the only thing that all the Muslims agree upon. Mm. And this is Salah al-Din. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him and have mercy on him. And before him, his teacher, his great teacher, Nur al-Din Zinki, he knew that the Muslims will differ on everything. We will differ on the fiqhi madhab, we will differ on the school of aqidah, we will differ on the politics, we will differ on everything, on the taste, but one issue two believers, two mu'min will not differ on is the importance of al-Masjid al-Aqsa and this Nur al-Din Zinki placed a great importance on and Salah al-Din followed him in this and united the Muslims around a common cause we cannot unite the Muslims around us a common madhab or a common uh, idea, except if this is something that Allah mentions in the Quran. There are only two mosques mentioned by name in the Quran, Al-Masjid Al-Haram and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Allah made Mecca baladan aminan. Mm. But he made Bayt Al-Maqdis, as Rasulullah says, the place of rebat and jihad until the day of judgment. It is the testing spot of the ummah. It is always going to be a hot place where the Muslims will be able to uh, always be tested. And Rasulullah in a beautiful hadith talks about the people of Bayt al-Maqdis. And who are the people of Bayt al-Maqdis? If we start with this, if you allow me, um, the people of Bayt al-Maqdis, who we call Palestinians today, are a mixture of the ummah. Mm -hmm. They are the grandsons, the offsprings of the Sahaba. Of the Mujahideen who came with Salah al-Din. Of the Ottomans. You see my city, Al-Khalil, uh, a third of it is actually Kurds who came with Salah al-Din uh, as Mujahideen. Uh, part of it is Turkish. Part of it is the offspring of the Sahabi Tamim bin Aws al uh, who Allah, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave him the land of Al-Khalil as a waqf dhurri from the time of Rasulullah until today it is in the same status. If you go to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and this, uh, last time I was there, uh, we went through the African quarter mm. and behind us there was, uh, uh, Black Palestinians, but my wife was not aware of this. So we were walking and they were speaking in exactly the same accent. So she looked behind her and she looked at me and she said, they speak with a Palestinian accent. I looked, I said, yes, they're Palestinian. How are they Palestinians? They're, they're, they're black. Uh, so she was shocked. And these came from Nigeria and, uh, uh central, um, uh, Central Africa to come and to make mujawara to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa a few centuries back so, right. from the Niger and Niger Nigeria and so on and they came and they settled and they became the neighbors of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and today they are Palestinians right. the more uh, the the Maghariba quarter which Salah al-Din gave to the Mujahideen and the families who came from North Africa. He dedicated that for them. And the Zionists in 1967, next to Al-Buraq wall, they destroyed that quarter completely with the houses, with the madrasa, with the colleges, with, with the zawiyas. Everything was completely destroyed. And the East people were ex expelled from being the neighbors of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. You see the, the people who hold the keys of the uh, uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, are the offsprings of uh, uh, Al-Nusayba from the time of the, the Sahaba and Salah al-Din renewed mm -hmm. this because the inter 
uh, Christian conflict. They said we will give the keys to the Muslims. They come every morning and every evening. They open the church and they close the church because no Christian can hold the key. They will fight with the others. So they gave this key to the Muslims who were keeping the peace amongst the Christians. Uh, this is Beit al-Maqdis. The Palestinians are, you have an Indian Zawiya, you have an Afghani Zawiya in al in, uh, close to Beit al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Uh, you have people coming from Bukhara, people coming from, uh, they, the Palestinians today who are around Beit al-Maqdis are representatives of the Ummah with every single uh, part of this Ummah is being represented by the people on that land. Yeah. Rasulullah talks about them and this hadith is incredible. He says, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي There is a group of my Ummah. They are always on the right path. Uh, they're always, uh, they over, over counter their enemies. Those who let them down, they will never harm them. And unfortunately, we see this today. The Muslim Ummah has let them down. And, uh, Allah, last time I was in Al Aqsa, I felt ashamed of the Muslim Ummah. I felt the Muslim Ummah was dead. Uh, because Al Masjid Al Aqsa, Inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa, with my own eyes, I saw a sister being attacked yeah. by a Zionist soldier. Not just a normal attack. He attacked her and he bit her with his own teeth like a vicious dog. Inside the Masjid, yeah. while they were reading the Quran. And an elderly woman tried to help. He pushed her. He break her hand inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa. When I think of this, Rasulullah raised the whole Muslim army for the protection of one Muslim woman in Bani Qaynuqa mm -hmm. because her scarf was uh, was exposed, her aura was exposed. Uh, the Khalifa al-Mu'tasim in the Abbasid period raised an army, went all the way to Ankara in Turkey for one single woman who was imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And today this Ummah, Muslim women are attacked inside Islam's holiest site, it hurts. And that day I cried, I felt the ummah is gone. But the people there, they are, their iman is strong. And Rasulullah repeating the hadith, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي على الحق. They are on the haq. We need to ask ourselves, where are we from them? If we are with them, then inshallah, may we be count on the haq. But if we are away from them, and we see many of the Muslim countries are actually working against them today. And that hurts when you see countries like the Emirates and like Bahrain and like Morocco and Sudan. So many of them who used to support these people today are turning their back on them. Uh, it hurts. It hurts uh, a lot. The hadith, if I continue it, الحق الله لا يضرهم من خذلهم حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم كذلك uh, they will stay on this path until the promise of Allah is fulfilled and they are on the haq and they will not deviate. The sahaba were so impressed. They said, Ya Rasulullah, where are they? He said, Fi bayt al wa akna fi bayt al mm -hmm. The people of Bayt al maqdis are the true representatives of this ummah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everyone who's hearing us, um, and seeing us that we are able to stand with them and to support them in what we can. Uh, we, it is not enough for them to be putting their lives on the line in protection of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa is no more important to them than it is for us. Why is it they are doing everything in their hands, uh, going every day to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa to protect it, and we uh, are... Uh, saying, oh, we will only make dua or we will send money. This is not enough. The ummah needs to have a strategy. This is our future. Mm -hmm. Al-Aqsa is the future. Bayt al-Maqdis is the future of this ummah. If you want this ummah to stand up again, let us all work together. Let us make our strategy like Nur al-Din Zinki and Salah al-Din did. Let us make our focus. Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, the liberation of Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, unite the Muslim around this common cause. The liberation will start the second Islamic revival by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah, you speak with so much of zeal, so much of enthusiasm and so much of passion for Masjid Al-Aqsa and Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa. May Allah instill within us all of this, inshaAllah. Uh, you've sparked indeed the curiosity. You've also sparked 
um, the, the, the nur of iman in our hearts as we are listening to you this afternoon. How do we take and build on this momentum? What is your advice to the community of South Africa? What is the strategy that we need to adopt based on what you are saying today? Yes, I think uh, the, the example of South Africa, actually there is a lot to learn from South Africa uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, what is happening in Beit al-Maqdis. What is going today in Beit al-Maqdis, South Africa lived in terms of the apartheid um, uh, a few decades uh, ago. And uh, this, uh, uh, this apartheid uh, that we are living through today in Palestine, there is a lot we can learn from this. But the advice to the people of South Africa is that we need to stand strong for this cause. Mm. This is not the Palestinian cause. This is our cause. And as humans, as Muslims, this is my cause and I will stand for it. Uh, all I can do. For the Muslim organizations, this is an ideal golden opportunity to bring all the Muslim groups to work together. If we have the Ra of Iman in our hearts, then Al Masjid Al Aqsa is our duty. And uh, actually, I've been so impressed uh, in during my visit. I met all different groups and uh, uh, organizations and this is the issue that brought them together they've never worked together before uh, or they have their differences this is the issue that will bring us together learn from the example of Salah al-Din and Nur al-Din and the Sahaba this is what bond this is a common goal that will uh, make this ummah strong in South Africa and across the, 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 the world. On an individual basis, this is for the organizations, let's work together and develop also, uh, research centers for Beit al-Maqdis in, in, in South Africa because knowledge is the important part. Mm -hmm. Let's have, uh, we've managed to develop this in the UK, in Malaysia, in Turkey, and now in Indonesia, uh, research centers to develop studies on Beit al-Maqdis studies, not just on the past, but also to discuss the future. And our coming conference actually is the future of Beit al-Maqdis and academic studies in particular, because we are still lagging behind, even after uh, a quarter of a century working with individuals, with setting up organizations for the academic work, we are still lagging behind. Uh, the, the Zionist narrative is still very strong. Mm. Uh, the Orientalist narrative is still very strong. The Muslim Islamic narrative, which is the haq, it is not being represented in academia. It is not being represented even to the Muslims. The Muslims are unaware of the importance of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. But coming down through making research centers, we will be able to disseminate this knowledge at different levels. The individual part, uh, everyone has a responsibility. Do not wait for uh, the world to change itself. Allah mm -hmm. says in the Quran, Inna Allah la ma bi qawm hatta ma bi anfusim. Nothing will change until we change it with our hands. And for us to do this, we mapped out five points based on the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These five points uh, are how Rasulullah connected the Sahaba to Bayt al-Maqdis. And I will just give the, uh, the, the main points and we'll, we're actually discussing them across uh, different parts of the lectures that we're giving. The first one, it was the spiritual uh, connection point between the Sahaba and Bayt al-Maqdis. Uh, the Sahaba used to pray towards al-Masjid al-Aqsa uh, for 14 and a half years. How can we use this as a point of action today in our life? We can make dua to, for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa on a daily basis. Dua is not enough, but dua is the start. It will create a bond between you and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And I recommend to our listeners to make this dua on a daily basis. Allahumma rzuqna salatan fil Masjid Al-Aqsa wa huwa hurrun aziz. Ya Allah, grant us a prayer in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa when it is free from occupation. This dua, uh, we make it in our sujood or after our salah, will reconnect us spiritually to the issue of Bayt al-Maqdis. And um, this dua actually is uh, praying for the ummah, for ourselves, and for al-Aqsa. Mm. This dua is saying, inshallah, al-Aqsa will be free when the ummah stands up again 
and Allah will give us a long life to see the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and to pray in Al-Aqsa after this liberation. Let's make this part of our word on a daily basis mm-hmm. uh, and connect spiritually. As-Salatu Mi'rajul Mu'min uh, the five daily prayers came during the night of Mi'raj. Let us make part of our Mi'raj every day when we make our Salah, uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in it. Number two is a third of the Quran is stories of prophets and the majority of them are prophets in Bayt Al-Maqdis and in the Holy Land. And the Sahaba were connected to this through this way and through the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What we're asking, the second point, uh, is people to learn more about Al-Aqsa and Bayt al-Maqdis through uh, reading an ayah, a hadith every day. So the dua will take a minute every day after each salah, a few seconds. Uh, read a verse every day. It will also take a minute or two. Or read about the experience of Salah al-Din or Nur al-Din or Umar ibn Khattab. Make it a knowledge quest. Try to learn more about what happened. And if you are saying that I'm unable to do this, do what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did every night. Rasulullah, as our mother Aisha narrates, before Rasulullah would sleep every night, he would read Surah Al-Isra. Why would Rasulullah want to recall this journey? Uh, Every night he would mention before he sleep the Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa on his lips. You might say to read the whole chapter is too much. Let's read as, as I asked one verse. Read the first verse of Isra before you sleep. At least that will create a bond between your heart and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. The third is a political bond to uh, link our mind. And this we can do like the Sahaba through the first Quranic prophecy when the Quran talked about the the war between the Romans and the Persians. Alif Lam Mim Ghulibatul Rum fi Adna al Ard in the land of Bayt al Maqdis. The Quran talked about this, and Abu Bakr made a wager. He made a bet, ten camels, three years, because the Quran says within three years. Then he goes back to Rasulullah, and Rasulullah says, "Go and increase the bet and increase the number of years." He makes it into nine years, and Abu Bakr is following the news coming from this land on it on. Every caravan that is coming. Religious, spiritual, and political. These Sahaba were connected to this land in every way. How can we do it today? There are so many social media. Uh, today, we, uh, yesterday, we were with a group of uh, uh, South Africans, and I asked them if they follow the youngsters, the social media of the people in Beit al Maqdis. Unfortunately, they were not. And I said, this is the minimum we can do and share. What we are seeing happening in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, let the world see it. And this is also part of uh, the, 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 political. and yes, the political is to be active and to expose the real face of this Zionist uh, state. The fourth, uh, so number one is to make dua every day. Number two, to learn something new every day or to read at least a verse from the Quran. Number three is to follow the political uh, situation and to share this with others. Number four, Four is not to support the Zionist state. And uh, a lot of people, when I say this, they are shocked. Uh, we're not supporting them. Unfortunately, in what e- we eat and what we drink, we are supporting them in a way or another. Uh, I will give one example that uh, has been exposed. Uh, Coca-Cola, which is famous across uh, the world, mm. is a company that gives millions of dollars to Israel every year. Not to Israel, the state only, to the Israeli army. Mm. So by us buying a can of Coke, actually we are participating in. And this, you might say, well, boycott, actually boycott helped the South African a lot. Mm. At that time, I was in, in, in the UK and people would go and buy the South African goods, mm. come to the checkout and cause uh, a mayhem. They say, ah, this product is for South Africa. I want to return it because this is an apartheid state. Mm-hmm. And people actually, this had an influence on bringing down this, this system. Uh, even if you might say the, the, it's backed by the West and other uh, countries, this, uh, the state of Israel. But if it's not economic, uh, 
effect it will have an effect in our souls and our minds and our children that we do not support injustice and this is a, a very important thing that we need to build in our children and ourselves the fifth the fifth and the last point is based on hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is to prepare the gift for al aqsa to prepare a gift uh, maymuna uh, the freed slave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to the Messenger of Allah on behalf of the woman uh, I mentioned earlier and she said, Ya Rasulullah, give us a fatwa about Bayt al-Maqdis. Rasulullah said, it is the land of raising and gathering, go and pray in it. For one prayer is equal to a thousand elsewhere. She said, what if one cannot go? And he said, then send the gift. The one who sends a gift is as if he has prayed in it. And there is a context to this hadith, but uh, the idea of preparing a gift for the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Think big. And uh, one great, uh, actually some of the greatest gifts were from women. Uh, one mentioned in the Quran, one at the time of Salah al-Din. At the time of Salah al-Din, the women of Diyarbakir in southern Turkey today prepared rose water that they had done with their own hands. For when Salah al-Din liberates Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, he will cleanse the crusader uh, Najasa from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Salah al-Din said he's never carried uh, an amana much heavier than that amana. And because it puts the amana on his shoulder that he has to liberate Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And when he entered Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, the place of the Mihraj of Rasulullah he took that rose water with his own hands and he washed the rock the first Qibla of the Muslims Allah. with his own hands. This was the gift that the woman of Diyarbakir prepared. The gift mentioned in the Quran is the woman, uh, the wife of Imran. She dedicated her child for mm. service of Allah in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And that was Maryam alayhi salam. And Maryam alayhi salam brought a, a great gift, another great gift. Isa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam in the Sahih hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam will come back to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Look at this gift. 2,000 years ago, the, her, the wife of Imran gifted to Al-Aqsa and this gift will be until the end of time when Isa alayhi salam will come. He will pray in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He will kill the Dajjal, the great fitna in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. One more gift from the teacher of Salah al-Din, Nur al-Din Zinki. He created a minbar mm. in Aleppo. And this member took 20 years to build without a single screw or nail. It was made perfectly. And when Salah al-Din entered Al-Aqsa, he asked for the member to be brought from Aleppo. It stayed in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa until 1969 when a Christian Zionist burnt it down mm. inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. 771 years. The reward of every khutbah Allah. was given to that great man in his grave. When you think of a gift, think great. Think something that will stay in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa for centuries to come, for thousands of years, that inshallah, when Isa alayhi salam comes, he will see your gift and your name in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. The honorable guest reminded us that there are five things that we can do to engage in daily to have a Masjid Al-Aqsa to learn about Masjid Al-Aqsa on a daily basis and to be politically connected with regards to the issue, to follow the news closely and also to not support Israeli products in the state and to prepare a gift for Masjid Al-Aqsa. Closing off with the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا تزال الطائفة من أمتي قائمين ظاهرين على الحق لا يضرهم من خذلهم وهم حتى يأتيهم الله وهم كذلك. That a group of my ummah will continue to be on the straight path, fighting for the right cause, and they will not be deterred by the detractors or the detractors around them until Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's aid and assistance will come. May Allah make us from amongst that group and count us amongst them, inshallah, on the day of Qiyamah. And indeed, a knowledge-based approach is such a sound and such a deep approach, as you know, the Zionists. The propaganda machine is also working through its curriculum in the schools where they are teaching their version of history in order to program and manipulate the facts of history and to distort 
what was once upon a time a pristine uh, legacy of our ummah. May Allah bless us all and save us from the propaganda of the Zionist machine. Wa ma'alina ila al-balagh. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.